So we're going to continue to read in the book of Revelation this month and this week. Uh, last week we started in Revelation chapter 1 to set the stage, and this week we're going to go into chapter 5, and uh, I'll review a little bit of the Revelation sort of handles to hold on to as you read the entire book, uh, but today we're going to dig in a bit in chapter 5, so I encourage you to, to follow along. This is the Apostle John speaking as he sees a vision. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll, a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slaughtered and by your blood you ransomed for God. Saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and they numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with a full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We can't see the whole way. So today, Lord, be for us the lamp and light for our journey. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we opened into the book of Revelation and talked about some of the signs and symbols that are present there that help us to navigate through the book of Revelation because it's, uh, we face it, right, it's very hard to read the book of Revelation, very hard to understand, it's even a bit frightening in places and we just don't know what our place is in it. So uh, I want to review a couple of those things really briefly. There are lots of numbers and lots of animals and lots of that in the book of Revelation. So you saw a bunch of numbers show up here today. So remember together or here that uh, we want to remember that the number seven means fulfillment or perfection or completion. Harkens back to the book of Genesis where there are seven days where God created the heavens and the earth. And, and so that seven days was just perfect fulfillment of what God wanted to do in creation at the very beginning. So when you see seven, uh, you're, you understand that everybody's there, it's perfect, it's fulfilled, uh, all that kind of thing. Also, you see the number 12 here, or derivatives of the number 12, 12 and 24. And so uh, what we learn from that is a representation of the 12 original disciples, of the 12 tribes of Jacob from the Old Testament, uh, and a you know, a derivative of 1224, meaning that there are more disciples, more followers of Jesus like us. So when you see 12, that's what you want to think about. And then finally, the other number is four that shows up here, and it can mean two things, which are really important. 
Four uh, me represents Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because by the time the book of Revelation is written, uh, we know that these four gospels the one, that were the ones that were in the widest circulation among the early church. And so um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John represented um, the primary message of the gospel, the whole message of the gospel. Because So you can't just read one of them, you've got to read all of them to understand the full breadth of the gospel message of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, but also, uh, secondly, that number four means the whole of the earth. So sometimes you'll see it represented north, south, east, west, four, meaning the corners of the earth. So the Christian message is not only for a certain segment or culture or region in the world, it's for all people, all of the gospels, all of the people all over the earth. So keep that in mind as you read, and those numbers show up here a lot today. So at the center of this passage is uh, this, uh, this word, scroll, uh, scroll. And it's really, for me, a really poignant passage. I got emotional just reading it again in preparation for the sermon because John is lamenting that there's this scroll, and in that scroll is written uh, what's coming next, the God's plan and design for the future. And in that, in that um, uh, drama that's playing out in, in, in life uh, is going to be suffering and pain, there's going to be judgment, and then there's going to be ultimate salvation and redemption. And the scroll represents where all of that is written down and where names are there and future is described there. And, and there's only one person who is perfect enough to open up that scroll and to have it read and that's Jesus. But John laments uh, before that that there, that there isn't anybody worthy to open the scroll, and so he weeps, as we heard and read uh, this morning. Uh, he weeps uh, that no one in heaven and the earth and under the earth and in the sea is worthy to open up that scroll, but then Jesus shows up, and Jesus is able. Jesus is worthy to open up the scroll. Jesus is the one who is perfectly able to balance mercy and judgment. And even though judgment may be a scary word for you, for us, you want someone like Jesus <laughs> to be judging you, judging me, because he is the only one able to perfectly balance mercy and judgment in your life and in the world. And that's why that he is the one able to open the scroll and do that. That's why He's the perfect Savior. That's why we want him doing that, and he can. He is able. So he opens the scroll up, and in that scroll has the plan, the design, the, the unveiling, the revealing of what is coming to be, and only he can do that. In my life in church, I've had the opportunity to be a part of a lot of building projects, capital building projects, campaigns. You've ever been around church long enough, every now and again, you got to replace the broken air conditioner, you've got to uh, build a building when it's exciting and the church is growing and you need more space. Uh, I've been a part of large building projects before and engaged with architects and spent lots of hours in committee meetings and, and spent lots of times with really gifted people around the table who have a lot of great uh, capacity in buildings. So we spend a lot of time thinking we need this thing, we need that thing, we need, we need it here or there. We spend a a lot of time thinking about what we want, but then we hire an architect, and the architect is the one who, who, who knows the big picture and who is able to, to describe every nook and cranny and everything that needs to go here and where and why. He has the big picture, and I remember Jim, and Jim was a gifted architect and actually a member of the church where, where, where I was serving uh, as I think about this particular project. <clears throat> And uh, after we gave all of our hopes and dreams to Jim, and, and all of our sort of uh, best thoughts and, and, and best interests and all the things, all the hopes and dreams that we wanted, we gave them to Jim the architect. And then Jim went away and we waited a long time. And then Jim finally came to uh, our first meeting and, and literally in the 21st century, uh, with all of our technology, Jim walks in with this big, look like a scroll, this big rolled up uh, set of design. 
for us. And it was really like he was literally unrolling a scroll for us on the table. And and it was big. And he carried it under his arm. And he walked in. And really, Jim was the only one who could explain uh, what was in the design. You see where I'm headed? So Jim unrolled the scroll, and he put plates, things, weights on the corners so that he could uh, t- talk about it. And really, only Jim understood. He cobbled together all the things, and really, only he could understand and explain it. And Jim was great. He was humble, uh, sharp, brilliant. And as he laid out that whole design, it just... It just made sense. There were things that we never thought of. There are things that we never could think of because we're not a gifted architect. And even though we thought we had great ideas and we thought we had lots of, uh, lots of things, designs and, and ideas and all the rest of it, um, really it was his gifts, his role, his capacity alone that could bring all of that together in a grand design and plan. Part of being a Christian is understanding our limitations. Part of being a Christian is understanding our limitations and understanding that we only have a small set, a small subset of understanding about, about, um, about God's plan for the world, about what's best for me or what's best for somebody else. Um, uh, we we, we kind of think we have good ideas. We kind of think we have a plan, but, but God is really the one who has the perfect plan. God can see into the future. God can know the trials and tribulations that will come. God knows how we're going to be rescued from that in Jesus, and God has the, the grand design at the end of it all where heaven and earth, Revelation later describes heaven and the earth, become one. And, and really, it's the redeemed Eden. Uh, it, it, it gets back to, to the creation as it was originally intended. But in the meantime, um, uh, we look for plan and design, and we try to get that from other places and other sources, and we look to other people to, uh, to be that for us. We look for other people to be Jesus for us, quite honestly. We, we look in other places for the plan, the design for our lives for salvation. Um, I've sat with a lot of couples over the years, and as we talk about marriage and life together and parenting and all the rest of it, um, I often find myself saying, uh, uh, because, uh, I should say, because oftentimes in these sessions, you know, hu- husbands have critiques about their wife, and wives have critiques about their husbands, and, and, and so they go back and forth about that, and I often find myself saying, uh, look, um, we need to be the best spouse we can be by the grace of God, so, so we don't let ourselves off the hook. Um, we need to be the best spouse we can be by the grace of God, um, but your spouse can never be Jesus for you. Your spouse must be in love with Jesus more than they're in love with you. Your spouse can never be everything that you need them to be. It doesn't let us off the hook. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, give us a pass. And if you're unmarried, uh, maybe it's a best friend that you look for support and keep looking for support. God sends people to our, don't misunderstand me, God sends people in our lives. Our spouses can be uh, just a beloved and holy partnership. Uh, We can count, we should be able to count on them and all the rest of it. Uh, But at the end of the day, we must understand that our spouses, our best friend or whoever it is cannot be Jesus for us. They cannot save us. They cannot give us everything um, that we need. And the same is true about other things in life. Um, We come to count on um, a great job. We come to count on a really nice car. We come to count on a really healthy funded pension. Uh, We come to count on all of these things because somehow we we think that if we surround ourselves with enough stuff and enough so-called security, uh, all all will be well. Um, Life will go well. The grand design that I have designed for my life and the plan is all going to go, and we forget about We forget about the big picture. We forget that God alone understands, so we must seek God to understand the grand design and grand plan for our lives. 
And it's so very important to do that. It's so very important to, to, to do that. Um, but we seek, um, we seek that plan and design in all kinds of places. We must, must seek after a relationship with Jesus. We must acknowledge that Jesus alone is the one who is worthy to unveil, reveal that plan for us and for, uh, and for the world. So important, so important. Jesus be acknowledged as the one who can do that for us, who's the one who has, who has the good plan. Nobody else, can, nobody else can do that. The other thing is uh, to remember as Christians is that's good news, not, not only for us. It's good news that, that we have a Savior in Jesus, that he has a good plan and design for our lives, that it's good, and that we, we ultimately don't look anywhere else for, the one, for, for someone to do that kind of thing for us. Um, it, it's Jesus that's worthy. Um, but we ought, to, we ought to tell other people about that. Um, we ought to be able to say to somebody uh, in their life um, what Jesus means for you, that Jesus can, can, can provide a plan for your life. And, and, it, and it will go through suffering and pain, but God will be with you. And in the end, it's all going somewhere, somewhere beautiful. And it's all headed towards salvation. You ought to be, uh, we ought to be able to say that to somebody um, in our lives. I always, uh, you ever, um, I know you have, you've called uh, some number, some help number, and you need help number to get you through to your insurance, somebody or whatever. And they're often when you call, uh, that person says, let me put you on hold, right? <laughs> And you dial this number, number two for this person or whatever, and, and they put you on hold. And <clears throat> if you're lucky, you get to talk to a, a real person. And then uh, I, I actually always appreciate it when that person, when you finally get connected with a person, when that person says, you know what, uh, I don't know how to help you, but I know who does. Right? You ever run into somebody like that on the phone? It uh, doesn't always happen, uh, but sometimes uh, they will say, you know, I don't have the answer for what's really going to help your problem and your challenge, but I know who does. And let me connect you with the one who can help you. It's beautiful. Love when that happens. You kind of admit that, that you don't have all the answers. You, 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 we surrender the idea that I don't have the plan. I don't have the grand plan. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that is, um, but I know somebody who does. And, and that's what we do as, as Christians, both for ourselves but for other people. We, we don't claim to know more than we know. Uh, we don't claim to be wiser than we are. Another place in Scripture says that. We, we don't claim to be wiser than we are. We don't claim to have grand visions that we don't have. We don't claim to have knowledge of the future that we really don't have. Um, nothing's promised to us that way. But as Christians, we know who can help. We know who can help. It's good to remind ourselves of that. It's good to remind other people about that. It actually takes a lot of heat off of you, right? It takes a lot of the heat off to, to, to not try to come up with the answer for somebody or to come up with the plan and to be able to say, you know what, I know who is worthy to answer you. I know who can help you. I'll finish with how the passage finishes. <clears throat> and you just can't really pass this, this scripture by, this little section we read, without talking about the way they finish in this particular section. They finish with worship. You see, once they, they John and, and, and those who are in the vision, once they acknowledge that, that Jesus is the only per perfect one who can open the scroll and reveal the plan and design, once they acknowledge that, worship breaks out. Worship breaks out. And it's worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb who was slain, worthy is the lamb Jesus. Of course, it's talking about Jesus. Worthy is the lamb. And, and, and worship becomes the natural response of saying, oh, I surrender. I, 
I admit that I don't have the plan. I, I admit that God has the plan for the world. And, and worship just breaks out when we realize that it breaks out here, worthy is the lamb. And that word worthy is really significant because there were a lot of Roman neighbors of the early Christians, and they used that word worthy a lot, but they didn't all use it in relation to Jesus. They used it in relation to Caesar the Roman emperor. So it's countercultural, revolutionary, dangerous to not say worthy is Caesar, worthy is the emperor. He can't do it. Worthy is the lamb, Jesus. I hope you'll catch a little bit of the radical nature of that worship, of saying worthy, worthy, is the Lamb, Jesus. He is the only one. No one else can save us. No one else has the big picture. No one else has the grand design. There's no comfort or no army riding to our rescue except for Jesus. Jesus is the one who is worthy. Jesus is the one who can unroll the scroll and reveal God's plan and design for creation. So wor worship is the natural response to God's goodness. And I'd encourage you, um, I I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad we gather for this one hour of worship every single week. Maybe you do a little bit more than that. Maybe you come to some special things or go to two services or whatever. That's wonderful. I also want to encourage you, though, <clears throat> to make your life an act of worship. So what would it look like in your life that as you work, and as you serve, and as you relate in your family, and, and all, the, even the grocery store, wherever, you, wherever life takes you, what would it look like for your life to be an act of worship? Where we point people, not to ourselves, but to the one who can help, who can save. I invite you to pray with me. God, we thank you for salvation in Jesus. We thank you for that you have the grand plan and design. And even when we bump up against our limitations, we know you have it. Uh, we know you have, you're holding us, that you have the plan. You have the salvation. You're going to lead us through all the choppy waters and ultimately lead us home to you. And so we praise you and thank you. Worthy are you to be our Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.